This video is brought to you by Nano, creators of virtual reality tools for immersive molecular visualization and interaction. Follow the link in the video description to download Nano and explore molecules yourself. Let's go ahead and start talking about proteins, a little bit about what they are and why they're important. First thing is, what are proteins? Well, proteins are polypeptides that, um, and of course, polypeptides are just long strings of amino acids connected by peptide bonds. Uh, but they're polypeptides that specifically have folded into some three-dimensional structure that serves some function. Okay, that's what a protein is. Um, so proteins and polypeptides, they're both long strings of amino acids, but proteins are polypeptides that have folded and taken on some sort of functional role. So if we think about a string of amino acids, we just have a polypeptide. So if each of these circles represents an amino acid, we have a bunch of them connected to each other in a long strand, almost like a chain, um, and it folds, takes on a certain structure that has a function, that is a protein. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about the structural details later. I wanna give a quick 3D visual representation of the difference between a polypeptide and a protein. So here we've got a short peptide. It's specifically seven amino acids long. And if I zoom in here, we can actually go through and see the uh, NCC backbone, right? Where each NCC, of course, is an amino acid residue. We can see if we uh, zoom in a little further, specific residues, right? Like right in the middle there, that's valine. Um, but this is basically just a short peptide, right? Um, if we look over to the left, we see the, the amino end, and over to the right, we see the carboxy end. But this is just a peptide, right? And of course, because it's seven amino acids long, but if it were a lot longer, it'd be a polypeptide. But it's not a protein until that polypeptide folds upon itself, takes on some sort of structure, and then some sort of functional role. A protein, looks something like this. So this is a protein. It is specifically myoglobin. Um, and this is a polypeptide chain, a single polypeptide chain that folded upon itself, took on this three-dimensional structure. And this 3D shape is functional, right? Myoglobin specific function is to de deliver oxygen muscle, uh, excuse me, <laughs> oxygen to muscle tissue. So um, you can see that the sort of stick model representation is very similar to that of that peptide we just saw, but of course it's a lot longer and it's folded upon itself. Um, sometimes it can be represented a little bit differently uh, instead of this uh, ball and stick model, uh, or excuse me, instead of this stick model, it would have a sort of surface view and look like this. It looks kind of like a glob, right? With, uh, with surfaces and that's, this is a globular shape and that term globular will end up uh, coming up and being important later when we describe certain different proteins. Okay, so the next question is kind of, why do we care? Why do we care about proteins? How are they important? Why are they important? Where are they important? And if you know anything about proteins, you know there's like a gajillion places and, and reasons why proteins are important. Um, there's a, a, there's a, I even wrote that here. There are a gajillion places to find proteins in our bodies and they serve a variety of functions. So speaking of which, let's talk about the major functions of proteins. So first thing is catalysis, okay, catalysis of biochemical reactions. Um, many proteins are enzymes, which uh, enzymes are just biological catalysts. Catalysts, of course, speed up chemical reactions. When those reactions are biological reactions, um, those catalysts are then called enzymes. And enzymes, many of them are proteins. Um, and so, in fact, pretty much all of them um, are proteins. Uh, an example, uh, here we have a, a reaction converting glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. This is the first reaction of glycolysis. Hexokinase is the enzyme that catalyzes that reaction, and hexokinase is a protein, okay? So here is that actual hexokinase protein. This is what actually goes through and catalyzes the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And by applying this surface simulation, we can actually visualize uh, the hexokinase more as uh, what we typically think of when we think of its globular structure. It also helps us visualize these little pockets where we can zoom in here and actually see the glucose 6-phosphate in there. And um, we can actually s select that uh, glucose 6-phosphate and kind of pull it out off of the protein out of that little pocket. Uh, so we'll select it, go through and split it from the protein, and just go ahead and pull it out. And so now we can see there, this actual um, uh, model has the glucose and glucose 6-phosphate both um, in that little pocket. So we can zoom in here and kind of take a closer look at that glucose and glucose 6-phosphate, especially relative to the size of that protein.
And uh, it's worth noting that nearly every single reaction that occurs in our cells is catalyzed by some enzyme. And so what happens basically is that you have some sort of substrate um, binding an enzyme at its active site, that little site there uh, where, the, where the substrate binds is called the active site. Um, and then it converts that substrate into a product. Okay, That's a very important function of proteins. The next thing is the binding of molecules or the binding of ligands. And a ligand is just something that binds something else that is bigger than itself. Okay, so um, for example, hemoglobin is um, a protein that binds oxygen. So oxygen is the ligand, uh, and it's got four different um, four different subunits that make it up. Uh, hemoglobin, of course, is important in binding oxygen and delivering um, oxygen, um, carrying oxygen through the blood and to the tissues from the lungs. Okay. Uh, myoglobin is similar in that it also binds a ligand. That ligand is oxygen. Um, it's it's only got one polypeptide unit though, um, and it's important. Its function is a little bit different. It's important in uh, delivering oxygen to the muscle tissues. Here to the right we've got hemoglobin, and the smaller structure to the left is myoglobin. And both of these proteins bind oxygen. And you'll notice there's similarity in structure with these ribbons, and that makes sense because their functions are similar. They both bind oxygen. This colorful structure here is also hemoglobin. I just got its four different subunits in different colors. We got pink, green, red, and blue. And what I want to do is take off one of these uh, subunits. We'll take this pink one and we'll place it next to myoglobin. And taking a look at it like this helps us visualize the structural similarities, right? We can see how these ribbons are arranged in a similar fashion. And that makes sense. They both function in binding oxygen. Um, so it makes sense that they have these structural similarities. Okay. Um, another example of a protein that binds some sort of ligand or some sort of molecule, um, we've got antibodies or immunoglobulins. So antibodies are uh, these uh, immune proteins that are sort of Y-shaped, and those antibodies go through and bind antigens, and they're involved um, in the immune system. And that's about the extent to which I want to talk about that here. Okay. Another major function of uh, proteins is structural integrity or structural support. And so um, here we're talking about proteins that don't exactly play a role in helping a reaction move forward. They don't bind anything specifically. They just, they're just important in maintaining structure. Okay, so some examples here are collagen, keratin, and elastin. And uh, these are all fibrous proteins. And when I think of a fiber, I think of like a rope, okay? And collagen actually is, is kind of like a rope. It's, like, it's got a triple helix. Looks something like this, one, two, three, three sort of strands, uh, kind of like those little pretzel twists. Here is a better visual. You can actually see the three green spirals that actually make up that triple helix. The point is that uh, it's long and, and, and fibrous and it's, it's meant to be uh, strong and just supportive structurally. Uh, collagen is, is, the, is a, the main component of connective tissue, it shows up in the uh, ligaments, tendons, skin, bone, cartilage, and it's actually the most abundant protein um, in mammals. Okay, keratin is also um, a component of connective, connective tissue. Um, it's important in the hair and nails. Elastin is also a component of connective tissue. Um, it, it's what allows the skin to be stretchy. Okay, so next up, another function is transport across membranes. So let's scroll this down a bit here. So the idea here um, is that proteins can be involved in allowing some sort of uh, substances or actual compounds or molecules to go from one side of the membrane uh, to another side of the membrane. And that can happen in, in a couple of different ways. One of the ways it can either happen um, with channel proteins or with carrier proteins. Both of these proteins are sort of shown in purple here, and they're both embedded in the membrane. And um, here, the difference is that with channel proteins, you have molecules um, on one side, and they make, make their way through the channel protein because the channel protein is basically like a tube, right? So they kind of just go and make their way through the tube over to the other side, okay? So they get from one side of the membrane to the other by simply passing through uh, that tube, that is that channel protein, 
okay? So here we have ATP synthase, which of course makes ATP in the electron transport chain. It's embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane shown back there. The membrane bound component is the F0 subunit there, and the F1 subunit right there actually makes the ATP from ADP. So let's move that membrane out of the way and take a closer look at this protein. Up top here, we can actually see the F0 subunit is very tube-like, and it's actually an example of a channel protein, right? We can look th right through this tube. So what happens is that protons flow from the intermembrane space through this tube um, back into the mitochondrial matrix. They just actually made their way right through. And that is coupled to the phosphorylation of ADP, uh, to make ATP, by that F1 subunit down there. Um, whereas carrier proteins, they function a little bit differently. They will go through and bind something on one side of a membrane, and then, um, then the protein will sort of change its sort of conformation and then spit the, the, the particle out on the other side of the membrane, okay? So here, the particle doesn't pass through the protein. Um, the protein's not just a tube, but it actually gets carried across, okay, over to the other side. So both of these types of proteins accomplish a similar thing in that they're carrying, or excuse me, I shouldn't say the word carry, um, but they, they're both involved in taking something from one side or allowing something from one side of the membrane to the other. They just do it in different ways. Another thing is signal transduction. And this is kind of difficult to describe here. Uh, signal transduction is the idea that um, some signaling molecule or some signal, um, like this little orange guy here, um, can, can show up on basically the outside of a cell and bind a membrane protein and then cause some sort of cellular response on the inside of the cell. Now, this involves a multitude of proteins. Right here, we have a GPCR, which stands for a G-protein coupled receptor uh, in purple. And over here, this is the G-protein, which has multiple subunits. Uh, when it gets activated, it can stimulate um, the activity of an effector, effector enzyme, and that can trigger a whole cascade of different um, uh, things to happen. Uh, and many of those things that happen involve proteins. So, and ultimately, there's some sort of cellular response. But the point is that in making it so that a signal is transduced um, from the outside to the inside of a cell, um, that involves many proteins. Okay. And last but certainly not least is movement. So, um, if we're talking about uh, movement within a cell across um, or involving um, microtubules, tubulin is important. Uh, if we're talking about muscular movement, we're talking about actin and myosin. Um, also, dynein and kinesin are important when it comes to movement. There's just a bunch of different proteins and a bunch of different structures and a bunch of different functions. Okay. The theme basically is that structure determines function. Hope that video was helpful. Thanks for watching.